from deep within the dunes of Africa's Namib Desert. A terrible secret is beginning to emerge. These are the remains of victims of the world's first death camp. A place where thousands of Africans were exterminated by the German army 30 years before the Nazis came to power. These remains have lain here, forgotten, for over a hundred years. But this terrible place is not unique. Scattered across the world are the sites of the massacres and genocides of imperialism. Where millions died in an aspect of colonial history that Europe often chooses to forget. These people were victims of the truth that lies behind the myth of the white man's burden. Throughout the 19th century, European scientists, writers and philosophers developed ideas to justify the mass killings of the Age of Empire. These same theories went on to inspire some of the horrors and the savagery that would consume Europe in the 20th century. The 19th century was to end with the worst crimes of empire, but it began with a great moment of optimism. In the 1830s, in the great plantations of the Caribbean, Britain prepared to become the first nation to end slavery. Three quarters of a million slaves across the Caribbean were about to be freed, and as Britain basked in her sense of national benevolence, it was presumed that the grateful slaves would transform themselves into a hard-working and Christian peasantry. The battle against slavery had been led from the pulpit by an alliance of Christian abolitionists and missionaries. They had fought the campaign from their churches and meeting halls. In the 1830s, it was their views that dominated the national debate on race. When slavery was finally abolished, there would have been an enormous sense of elation and achievement on the part of the abolitionists. Don't forget, this was a 50-year campaign from 1787 onwards, involving hundreds of thousands of ordinary British people, petitions, etc. So that when slavery was abolished, the abolitionists had won a sort of sense of triumph. I think they also felt that that question, am I not a man and a brother, was answered. The abolitionist response to that great question was that although men and brothers, black people were lesser men and lesser brothers. I think in that moment, the dominant perspective is of a hierarchical racial order but one in which it's a question of culture and civilization. They certainly do not think that black people are equal to them at this time. They think maybe at some time in the future they will be equal. The mission to raise up the black and brown peoples of the world to the supposedly superior level of white Englishmen was not to be confined to the former slaves. This was to be the great task that would justify the expansion of the British Empire. The abolitionists satisfied one aspect of their tutelage and governance of black people in that they fought and won for the freedom of black people. The next step was to send your stormtroopers, your missionaries into Africa and the Caribbean to finish off the job as it were. You know, these are heathens who have to be brought into, into the fold of Christianity. That notion of giving civilized values and modes of behavior to other peoples, that's the ideology that underpinned the empire. In the empire that the missionaries and abolitionists set out to create, Indigenous peoples would see their cultures destroyed and their religions eradicated. And yet all this seems almost benign when compared with the grim reality of what imperialism became. Because during the 19th century, their dream was gradually overwhelmed by another vision. One that claimed that the dark races could not be civilized and should instead be exterminated. The event that began the slow collapse of the missionary's vision took place in a then little-known outpost of Britain's vast and expanding empire. This is Tasmania, on the southern coast of Australia. What the British did on this small island was to resonate down through the Victorian age.
When the British started to settle in Tasmania in 1803, they encountered the ancient Aboriginal peoples of the island. Only 5,000 strong, they had lived in complete isolation for 10,000 years, on the very edge of the habitable world. The settlers saw these people through ideas brought with them from Europe. Quite early, you get expressions of disgust and shock about the way the Tasmanians lived. To the Europeans, it appeared that the Tasmanians were without culture, they were without religion, they were godless. So they looked upon the Tasmanians as people who'd been left behind uh, by history. And they also related to a very popular idea of the late 18th century, that is the great chain of being, that the various races of humankind were arranged in hierarchical order and that the Tasmanians were uniquely savage and primitive and therefore can be treated almost as animals. The British set about building a new capital and settling the surrounding countryside, land that for millennia had been the prime hunting ground of the Aboriginals. Out in these fields and pastures, far from the control of the authorities, the settlers were free to displace and abuse the Aboriginals. From the 1820s, a huge amount of Aboriginal land has been taken up. And there is this enormous struggle between Aboriginal people and whites. Of course, it's very hard to document a lot of the settler violence because they know that it is against the law to kill Aboriginal people. They are being told that Aboriginal people are British subjects. But they certainly reveal in their diaries and journals the desire to kill Aboriginal people. What became known as the Black War was a hidden conflict. The landscape itself was the only witness. The British settlers killed any Aboriginals they encountered. Whole groups were massacred. Kidnapping and rape became commonplace. The Aboriginals regularly attacked the settlers as they fought desperately to defend their land. And as the death toll rose, fear fused with hatred. In such circumstances, it was very easy, um, on both sides, no doubt, to regard the other side as being totally subhuman. I've got no doubt that the Aborigines thought the Europeans were people totally without morality uh, or without any restraint. Equally, the, the Europeans uh, slipped very quickly into a view that these people were animals and savages. So that conflict in such a racially divided society so easily tips over into an extreme feeling of hatred. The death toll of the Black War had terrifying implications for the Tasmanian Aboriginals. The British, who arrived in ever-increasing numbers, could replace their dead. But the Aboriginals, only 5,000 strong before the war, could not. And by the end of the 1820s, they were at risk of being completely annihilated. The only man who had any hope of halting the violence was the colonial governor, George Arthur. Now, the governor of Tasmania is an evangelical. He knows Wilberforce. And he is aware that his future and his reputation depends on how he deals with this problem above all else. Now, he's already been warned in the late 1820s by the British government that the rapidly declining numbers suggests that these people might be exterminated. And were this to happen, it would be an indelible stain on the reputation of the British Empire but by implication, it would be disastrous for his career. Governor Arthur set out to save the Aboriginals from the violence of the settlers, and to convince them of his good intentions, he produced a poster that was attached to trees in their homelands. It showed a fantasy of interracial unity. The poster spoke of British justice, promising equality before the law. The white killer of an Aboriginal would be hanged. If an Aboriginal killed a settler, he would be hanged. The poster also propagated the lie that the British wanted to integrate with the Aboriginals. It was both a fiction and a complete failure, because out in the bush, the killings on both sides continued. And in 1830, Governor Arthur embarked upon a new policy. He ordered the army to sweep across the area of European settlement in an attempt to capture the remaining Aboriginals. He offered a bounty for every Aboriginal taken alive, but the operation was a complete failure. Only two were captured, an old man and a young boy. After years of guerrilla warfare, 
the last few hundred of the original 5,000 Aboriginals had learnt to hide themselves in the bush. Determined to save them, and determined to take their land for white settlement, Governor Arthur changed tactics. He now turned away from the army and looked instead to a missionary, George Augustus Robinson. He was the leader of a band of Aboriginal converts and was now hired to go into the bush and bring in the remaining Aboriginals. Robinson took a message that the government wanted to come to some sort of an agreement, a negotiation, a peace treaty. And that is, I believe, undoubtedly the way the Aborigines saw it. They too saw this as a way to end a conflict which they had realised they could never win. They could never get rid of the Europeans. If they stayed and fought, they would be wiped out. And Robinson and his intermediaries convinced them that they should temporarily go to an island where they will be looked after and fed, and that they will ultimately come back to their homelands. The island was called Flinders Island and 300 Tasmanian Aboriginals who had been collected by Robinson were transported here. Robinson came with them in the official role of Chief Protector of Aboriginals, a job for which he was paid a total of £8,000, a small fortune in the 1830s. A settlement was constructed for them, complete with houses, farmland and a chapel. Robinson called it Point Civilization and a local artist was brought in to paint the portraits of the last of the Tasmanians. Ginny had been captured by Robinson following the near annihilation of her people by the settlers. Wuradi had been a chief until his community had been wiped out by a European virus. Another local leader, Manalagena, had been lured to Flinders Island with the promise that the convicts who had attacked his people would be brought to justice. And there was Truganini, whose husband had been murdered in front of her. All of them had seen their culture almost wiped out. What little was left, Robinson now set out to erase. Because Point Civilization was not merely a settlement, it was essentially a factory to transform so-called savages into civilised Christians. To become a successful Christian, he believes, you have to settle down, you have to live in a village. He wants to send the children to school, he wants to teach them to, to plough and to sow and to become agriculturalists. Forced to adopt an alien way of life and confined to an island hundreds of miles from home, they began to succumb to European diseases and what the local doctor called dejected spirits. They die one by one by one. Children are not being born and there must have been this enormous sense of trauma amongst them. A people that had once been strong and healthy suffering this enormous decline within a generation. George Robinson, the supposed saviour of the Aboriginals, was reduced to sketching out his plan for their future graves. Frequently he, he cries with the mourners, he weeps himself, he's so moved by their fate. But ultimately he says, well, it is better that they die here uh, having learnt the message of, uh, of the Gospels rather than be killed in the bush by the settlers. He finds a way to ease his own conscience so that Robinson's own beliefs, you see, protect him against a full accounting of what he was partly responsible for. Of the 300 Aboriginals lured to Flinders Island by the mid-1840s, around 260 were dead. Ginny, Manalagena and Wuradi had all succumbed. Truganini was one of the few survivors. She lived on, growing into old age. When she finally died in 1876, she was regarded by some as being the last full-blooded Tasmanian. A people whose story could be traced back 10,000 years had, within the span of a single lifetime, been almost exterminated. What had happened in Tasmania was far from being a unique event. 
Across the world, indigenous peoples were being pushed to the brink of extinction. In the South African Cape, the Khoisan peoples have been driven from their land, enslaved and killed in their thousands by British settlers and the Boers. The same forces had also attacked the ancient San Bushmen of the Kalahari, hunting them down as if they were animals. In Newfoundland, the native Beothuk peoples have been completely wiped out by Europeans. And in South America, wars of extermination sanctioned by the Argentinian government were raging against the Pampas Indians. Everywhere, it seemed, white settlers were destroying indigenous peoples. And in these very same years, the old racism that had been born in the age of slavery began to re-emerge. In the aftermath of abolition, competition from new sugar producers began to undermine Britain's once mighty sugar plantations. And as their estates rotted, the former slave owners began to blame their ruin on the people who had once made them rich. When the Caribbean plantations started to lose money in a big way, um, they fell back to the stereotype of the lazy Negro. The planters were then able to say to the abolitionists and to Britain, look, we are now in ruin because we no longer have the freedom to coerce blacks to work. We no longer have the freedom to, to drive them to work. These people are intrinsically lazy. You know, you were arguing that they were human beings, a man and a brother, but in fact they're not. They're still at the level of beasts. Whereas up to the end of the 1830s, it's been pretty unpopular to talk about Africans in those ways. And the respectable talk of the humanitarians about Africans has been you know, far more prevalent. By the mid 1840s, that's beginning to shift. Those who argued that abolition had been a failure due to the laziness and savagery of the slaves now claim that the Christian vision of a civilizing empire was also doomed. You might say that the moral momentum ran out of the abolitionist movement people found that other races were not becoming civilized. There was something difficult. They fought back. They didn't seem to learn as fast as we would appreciate to make them more pliable for us. Christian optimism about the spread of civilization and the Christianization of people of color around the world began to drain away. If the non-white races seemed to reject the message of the missionaries, some in Britain began to ask if they could be civilized at all. One of those who thought not was the eminent writer and historian Thomas Carlyle. In 1849, Carlyle published an essay entitled Occasional Discourse on the Negro Question, in which he appealed for a return to some form of slavery. It was printed and reprinted in magazines across the world and helped transform the 19th century debate about race. Carlyle's voice is a kind of prophetic voice, you know, which booms out from his study in, in Cheney Walk in Chelsea, and he writes these you know, extraordinarily powerful prophetic pieces which were read you know, with gusto by Victorians, and they, I mean, one can imagine them all sitting around their fires reading the latest periodical that's come out with this flow of rhetoric. In this case, in the occasional discourse on the Negro question, the flow of rhetoric is about the necessity for inequality. Inequality is the proper way to run a society. Those who know should rule those who don't know. Men should rule women. White people should rule black. Educated people should rule the masses. The depths to which these ideas became embedded within mid-Victorian society was revealed by one of the most controversial events of the whole 19th century. In 1865, the people of Morant Bay, a tiny settlement in East Jamaica, attacked a courthouse during a minor demonstration. In return, the Governor General imposed martial law and ordered his soldiers to go on a killing spree. It was a killing time. Nearly 500 people were just executed. 600 people just flogged, some of them to the point of death. And a thousand homes torched. Enormous um, disparity in terms of the retaliation against these people. And you know, when all this was being done, the so-called rebels didn't put up a fight. You know, when their houses were being burned, they didn't, they weren't terrorists, they weren't murderers, you know. All they wanted was for the judiciary to treat them with, with, a, with a sense of justice. The man who ordered the killings was Governor Edward Eyre. 
and when news of what he had done reached Britain, the liberal establishment was shocked. And the cause is taken up by the old abolitionists who've kept going and kept going and kept going, and the old anti-slavery societies kind of wrench themselves back into action and mobilize themselves again, and all the ladies who've been doing it for decades when the men have gone off and done more interesting things, you know, there they are with the machinery still in place that can be mobilized when you need to. Their tactic was to put Governor Eyre on trial for mass murder, but in court, he was acquitted, due in part to a huge wave of popular support. We had the whole of the House of Lords, parliamentarians, bishops, priests, the establishment, the aristocracy backing him, saying that he was justified. Uh, he was justified in imposing severe order on these people because that's the only language they could understand, because their black people were brutes. Eyre's defence was orchestrated by the high priest of the new racism, Thomas Carlyle. But behind him stood many members of the British literary elite, all of whom made known their support for Governor Eyre and his actions at Morant Bay. The art critic and writer John Ruskin. The author of Vanity Fair, William Makepeace Thackeray. The Reverend Charles Kingsley, writer of the children's classic The Water Babies. And Charles Dickens, the most celebrated author of the century. The notion of treating other people with some degree of justice and rule of law finally went out of the window and was demolished in, uh, in the 1860s over Morelby. You know, from then on we knew that the empire was about ruling people with a maximum degree of coercion. Some of the new ideas about race in the high Victorian age drew their evidence from the world of the dead. Based on the study of corpses and skeletons, the burgeoning science of anatomy laid the foundations for a new scientific racism. In Britain, the most important race scientist was a now forgotten Edinburgh surgeon. Ruined by a body snatching scandal in the 1820s, he had fled Britain in disgrace. But in the 1840s, Dr. Robert Knox resurfaced with the publication of a new book. Race is everything. Literature, science, art, in a word, civilization, depends on it. For Robert Knox in that book, race is everything. It determined your character, it determined your position in civilization, it determined your destiny. Can the black races become civilized? I should say not. He saw racial conflict and extermination happening all around the world. It was natural for him to believe that racial types were bound to struggle and that the superior races would dominate the naturally inferior ones. The Saxon race will never tolerate them. Never amalgamate, never be at peace. It is a war of extermination. One or other must fall. Robert Knox was not a lone voice. In America, a group led by the renowned craniologist Samuel George Morton had begun to collect the skulls of different races and compare them. Skulls were chosen to be measured because it was reckoned that the skull was the container of the most important part of the human body, the brain. The bigger the skull, the bigger the brain. The shape of the skull, the shape of the brain. The American School of Race Scientists concluded that the races, as measured through their skulls, were so different as to be separate species. Tasmanians, Africans, American Indians were not the lower races of men. They were perhaps not fully human at all. One writer compared the extermination of these races by white settlers as being like the melting of snow before the advancing rays of the sun. But the theory that was to have the most powerful impact upon race came not from the anatomists or the skull measurers, but from the work of one of the 19th century's greatest minds. The origin of species really threw a bombshell. First of all, into science. It really invented the science of biology. And then into religion and into society. And what Darwin did in some ways was to give an alibi for being a judge. If evolution had changed the races and the species of the world, why hadn't it done the same to humans? Many believed that Darwin's laws had done just that. Natural selection, they claimed, neatly explained and justified the global expansion of the great British race. Life favors a hierarchy of specialists. And you find that throughout the plant and the animal world. 
There are bugs on top of bugs on top of bugs, each one surviving at another's expense, each one filling a niche that another can't occupy. People, Darwin said, are the same way. They are expansive organisms. In other words, Englishmen are just like other organisms. They are successful because they are good at expanding. Those who understood colonialism and human competition in terms of Darwin's theories became known as the social Darwinists. Men like the radical biologist Thomas Henry Huxley and the famous economist Herbert Spencer. And social Darwinism foresaw very different fates for the various races of mankind. Evolution was in operation. It was advancing the most recently evolved, the most successfully evolved, that is the Northern Europeans and the British. But evolution also suggested that there had to be losers in this great cosmic process. And the losers were those peoples who could not compete. And once put into competition with superior races, were doomed to disappear. And this was likely to happen to all the native peoples in North America, in the Pacific, and in Africa. Across the world, the crimes of imperialism now came to be taken as proof that the social Darwinists were right. In North America, centuries of disease and war had devastated the Native Americans. Whole nations had been all but annihilated. In parts of the Australian mainland, the peoples of the outback were, it seemed, going the same way as their cousins in Tasmania. And across Africa, the scramble for empire had brought the might of Europe to bear against innumerable peoples, killing literally millions. The social Darwinists predicted a future in which these races, like many animal species, would only be remembered as curios, stuffed exhibits in anthropological museums. The white man's burden and the Christian dream of benign imperialism were rendered obsolete. Old missionaries who still talked about the equality of humanity and talked about everyone descended from Adam and Eve and talked about that the truth, the only truth came from the Bible, were seen as being extraordinarily old-fashioned, who simply had failed to come to terms with the great scientific thinking of the age. And these racial theories were not only applied in new colonies, but also in the oldest parts of the empire. In the traditional story of imperialism, British India has usually been represented as an example of benign imperial rule. The British Raj, we are told, was run by men who were competent, professional and wise. Men who brought order and prosperity to a chaotic land. But there is an aspect of Indian history that has been written out of this account of the imperial past. In the mid-1870s, the Great Deccan Plain of India was affected by the climatic phenomenon we now know as El Nino. And within months, millions of peasants had begun to starve. The monsoons had failed. People had eaten their food reserves. India stood on the precipice of a great human tragedy. At this point, the Viceroy of India, Lord Lytton, was totally absorbed in, in what was probably the largest party in world history, uh, celebrating the coronation of Queen Victoria as Empress of India. This is one of the great catering feats in history since it meant whining and dining uh, more than 60,000 satraps and princes and retainers and f friends of the British Empire uh, in India over the course of a long week. As Lord Lytton and the ruling elite of the Raj feasted at banquets and posed for official photographs, millions were slowly dying in the countryside. And the Viceroy justified his inaction with arguments gleaned from the social Darwinists. This was a very, very crass use of a Darwinian evolutionary notion of survival of the fittest, whereby a famine could be actually seen as an instrument of, of Darwinian winnowing. Yes, that people who were unfit uh, would effectively perish as a result of this. And to intervene to stop them perishing was really to interfere with, with almost a rule of nature. What made the famines especially deadly? was that the British had dismantled ancient systems that had for centuries prevented food shortages from turning into famines. 
if you'd had a poor monsoon and there was a food shortage, many people still had enough. They may have had less, but they would have had enough because they grew their own food, or they would have had access to it from, from other groups in the community who would share it with them during a time of crisis. All this had been wiped away when the British forced the poorest peasants to grow cash crops like wheat and rice for export, thereby ushering them into a global market. And in the 1870s, that market condemned them to death. By 1877, millions in southern and central India were starving. In desperation, parents sold their children for scraps of food. Many thousands committed suicide. And in some places, the people were forced into cannibalism. And all the while, the food that could have saved them was piled up on the docks of Madras, ready to be shipped to Britain and America. But to Lord Lytton, it was no more than an unfortunate byproduct of the iron laws of social Darwinism. If you read the letters of Lord Lytton, what is so striking about them is not simply their fanatical devotion to, uh, to the market and, the, and, and market forces. It's not simply their you know, parsimony and desire to spend as little as possible, but the enormous calm with which they accept the fact that millions of Indians would die because these are Indians they believe are the useless part of the population, the poorest of the poor, people condemned to death by nature. When finally Lytton was pressured into action, his solution proved just as deadly as the famine itself. Lord Lytton sets up a system of outdoor relief that looks more like Nazi concentration camps than anything representing a uh, decent human charity. First of all, there's the obligatory test. You can't be relieved that is given a job or food within 10 miles of your residence. You must walk, and you must walk sometimes distances of hundreds of kilometers, and tens of thousands of people die in the course of that. Then you're put to work doing heavy labor, very heavy labor, breaking stone, working on the railroads, and you're confined then to swallowed camps where your daily diet is in caloric terms less than that provided to inmates at Buchenwald and other Nazi concentration camps. They become literally and simply death camps. And perhaps worst of all, children were now too weak and small to do the necessary uh, work. Children became the, the main victims of Lytton's cool-hearted policy. Eight million Indians died in the famines of the 1870s. But they were not the only famines of the British Raj, and they were not the last. Famines returned in the 1880s and the 1890s, and in all, almost 30 million Indians starved to death under British rule. A story airbrushed out of the glorious accounts of the Raj and the men who ruled over it. Social Darwinism had justified genocidal policies in the colonies, and in the same years, it also fueled new fears amongst the British elite, fears of other dangerous races living in their midst, the working classes of their own cities. Race and class are actually very close to each other. If you look at books about race around Darwin's time, they often talk about the Cockney race, the English country race, the, Sc the Scottish race. There were drawings of the head of a typical member of the Cockney race, and the word was used quite seriously. There were maps made of where the criminal races lived. These were the rookeries, this was the East End, the, uh, the melting pot of all the horrors that went about infect the rest of the, part of the population. Race scientists and social reformers visited prisons to study the criminal races at first hand, and among them was Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton. Galton was terrified by the fact that the underclass were reproducing faster than the middle classes. Darwinian law had, it seemed, been turned on its head. The least fit were surviving. Reversing this situation became his mission. Darwin had looked backwards. Where had we come from? Galton turned the telescope round and looked forward. Where were we going? And he devoted much of the rest of his life to the idea of understanding Homo sapiens, us as a species, and trying to direct where Homo sapiens was going to go in order to become more sapient, more wise in the future, more of a genius, and less of what he saw, more stupid, more ignorant, and more uh, decayed. Galton designed a new science of human selective breeding he dreamed of encouraging the middle classes to have more children and inhibiting breeding amongst the lower and criminal classes. And he named his new science eugenics. In the last decades of the 19th century, 
it became widely respected, attracting an array of high-profile supporters. They included many of the great figures of the late 19th, early 20th century, people like George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, uh, Winston Churchill, all of them absolutely convinced eugenicists. In the first years of the 20th century, all the racial theories developed in the Victorian age, eugenics, social Darwinism and scientific racism, came together in a forgotten outpost of colonialism. This is Namibia. But at the dawn of the 20th century, it was the German colony of Southwest Africa, and home to an ancient people called the Herero. In 1904, they rebelled against the brutality of German rule. What followed was to prefigure the worst crimes of the 20th century. The Germans committed innumerable massacres and atrocities, but they were unable to hunt down and destroy all the Herero people across such a vast landscape. And when the Nama, another of the Namibian peoples, rose up, the Germans turned instead to a recent invention, the concentration camp. In these camps, the Herero and Nama were imprisoned and enslaved. Thousands were worked to death, others raped, beaten, or simply murdered by the guards. The most infamous and deadly of the camps was at a place called Shark Island. Shark Island was established for the express purpose of killing people. Anybody placed on that island, everybody knew they were going to die. People knew that, the German officers knew that. If I were to have to use the language of the Nazi period, then I would certainly see Shark Island as a death camp. The people were put together in Shark Island from all over Namibia. Heroes, Tamaras, Bushman, Nama. And they had cool blooded murder there. My own family, my ancestors, they were also killed there. In this desolate place, on the southern edge of Africa, three and a half thousand people were exterminated with a speed and efficiency that was to become the hallmark of 20th century slaughter. The genocides which took place in Namibia in 1904 to 1909, they are the precursor to what happens in the Nazi period. They are the precursor. They have the same symptoms in the sense that you can see the bureaucratization of mass killing. And this, for me, is the central thing. It's not just killing for killing. No. It's a combination between killing and bureaucracy. Today, Shark Island is a campsite for tourists. The Africans who were frozen and starved to death here have been almost erased from memory. But a century after the Namibian genocide, the true horror of what happened on Shark Island is beginning to re-emerge. In a recently discovered mass grave, just a few kilometers from the site of Shark Island, lie some of the victims of the 20th century's first genocide. Other victims were denied even the meager dignity of a mass grave. They became the raw material of racial science. Their skulls, and even severed heads, were sold to museums in Europe and used to prove the inferiority of Africans. The trade in skulls was so accepted that it was even depicted on a postcard. In the aftermath of the genocide, German racial scientists continued to use Namibia as a field laboratory and the African peoples who had survived as their subjects. In 1908, a eugenicist called Eugen Fischer traveled to the small town of Rehoboth, home to a people of mixed Boer and African heritage who called themselves the Rehoboth Bastards. Fischer and his assistants spent months photographing, measuring, and examining the inhabitants of this town, people whose descendants still live here. The person at the 
bottom there is my grandfather, Malcolm McNabb, and above him is his brother, Charles McNabb. My grandfather used to talk a lot about what they did, measurements, the eyes, the nose, the lips, the ears, hair, etc. They was not aware of the nature of the experiment. Lying in the vaults of an archive in modern-day Namibia, Eugen Fischer's original files and photographs remain as he left them a century ago. They reveal his methods and also his aims. Here Eugen Fischer has lined the different pictures up next to each other to try to trace very specific facial features like the eyes or the noses. And the reason he's done this is to try to show how very specific African facial features like high cheekbones and the drawn out eyes that represent the African genes are very prominent and become more prominent through the degenerations. Eugen Fischer came to Namibia to prove one basic point and that was that racial mixing was always bad and that the African gene is dominant over the white gene. Fischer's work in Rehoboth sealed his reputation as one of Germany's leading racial scientists. It also brought him recognition from a nation that was then experiencing the greatest influx of immigration the world had ever seen. In the first years of the 20th century, the ethnic makeup of America was being transformed as millions of immigrants poured into her great cities. Many of those who feared that mass immigration would lead to widespread racial mixing looked to the ideas of eugenics, an increasingly powerful science. Eugenics flourished, mutated, and went out of control when it got to the United States. And the irony is that the eugenics movement in the United States, which, which uh, certainly descended directly from Galton, um, had the great advantage of having a lot of money, a huge amount of money. Some of that money was used to establish the Eugenics Records Office, ran by the infamous Charles Davenport. In order to defend the health and purity of the white race, Davenport and his followers sought to identify those classes and those races in America whom they considered genetically unfit. Identified and monitored, the scientists would then take control of their lives and their fertility. Once you were identified as a certain class, it meant what school you could go to, what cemetery you could be buried in, where you could live. It was a matter of life and death. Marriage laws were established in dozens of states around the United States saying that people could not marry outside of their group. Blacks could not marry whites, um, Indians could not marry blacks. In Virginia, if you married the wrong person, meaning interracial marriage, they would unmarry you, they would invalidate your marriage. 27 states passed eugenics marriage laws and the eugenicists spread their message using the new medium of cinema. The propaganda was intended to protect the genetic health of the white race. This would be achieved by eradicating those deemed unworthy through forced mass sterilization. They went about methodically tracking ancestry and, tar and targeting bloodlines for extinction. That's eugenics, the effort to create a white master blonde, blue-eyed, master race by wiping out other bloodlines until they were left only with themselves and people who resembled themselves. And what's important here is that these people thought they were saving humanity. These people thought they were liberals, they were reformers. Eugenics was a worldwide movement. In Sweden, an official program forcibly sterilized 60,000 people, mental patients, and members of the ethnic minorities. In Britain, the eugenic society received widespread support from across the political spectrum. But it was in Germany that the radical ideas of the American eugenics movement found its most receptive audience. 
anything connected to America would be, seem to be modern, progressive, scientific, democratic, reasonable, so it must be good. America was the future, the force of the future. Secondly, I think that many European eugenicists, including the Germans, like the tone adopted by American eugenicists, which was very radical and sort of no-nonsense, and uh, they didn't use euphemisms. They said exactly what they meant. The Americans provided more than just inspiration. American foundations also bankrolled the development of German eugenics. This was the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology and Human Heredity. In the 1930s, the men and women who worked here received grants from the American Rockefeller Foundation. And the leading scientist here was the man who made his name in Namibia, Eugen Fischer. Under the Nazis, Fischer was empowered to sterilize the racially mixed people of Germany's Rhineland, 400 of them, all children. The majority of those sterilized by the Nazis before 1939, however, were the mentally ill. But when the Nazis began their war, they abandoned sterilization in favor of adult euthanasia, the Nazi euphemism for murder. The victims of this program were amongst the first people gassed by the Nazis, but the program was restricted to the mentally ill. When um, they have killed the target figure of mental patients they want to kill, which is roughly 70,000 people, they slightly exceeded it. So the first thing they do then is to contact the SS, who have large numbers of what they deem to be sick um, concentration camp prisoners, in other words, people who might have got wear glasses or you know, be myopic or have a wooden leg or something. So they want them out of the way, so these people oblige, and they take 15 or 20,000 people from the concentration camps and kill them on behalf of the SS. It's a bit like sort of contract work. And then when the um, uh, SS and other people have decided they're going to go for the big project, which is to kill the Jewish population of Europe, and in particular that of Poland, which is the biggest population they're concerned with, then those people push themselves forward and say, well, hey, we can do this, we've done it, we have a record of doing this, we murder people. And they become the core personnel in all the big extermination camps. These killing centres were the second network of concentration camps and death camps in German history. And the experts in eugenics, or race hygiene, as the Germans called it, were involved not just in their day-to-day -day running, but also in the highest levels of planning. It's worth reminding ourselves that the Bonze Conference, which is the one that set up the plan for the final solution, almost half the people around that table had doctorates, PhDs, in race hygiene, or genetics, as we'd say today. So there really is a genuine link between the Galtonian agenda and the horrors which happen in Germany. The German experts in race hygiene who assembled here at the Wannsee Villa outside Berlin dreamed of racial genocide, just like their spiritual predecessors, the race scientists and the social Darwinists of the Age of Empire. But the colonial genocides, inspired and justified by the 19th century theorists, have been written out of Europe's history. The horrors of the Shark Island death camp. The destruction of the Tasmanian aboriginals. the 30 million victims of the Indian famines. All have been forgotten. The erasure of this memory encourages the belief that Nazi violence was an aberration in European history. Though the Holocaust itself was motivated by the fanatical anti-Semitism of the Nazis, it can also be seen as part of a longer historical continuum, one that identifies it as a logical extension of scientific racism. But this history, like the bones in the Namibian deserts, refuses to remain buried forever. black people are equal to them at this time, they think maybe at some time in the future they will be equal. The mission to raise up the black and brown peoples of the world to the supposedly superior level of white Englishmen was not to be confined to the former slaves. This was to be the great task that would justify the expansion of the British Empire. The abolitionists satisfied one aspect of their tutelage and governance of black people in that they fought and won for the freedom of black people. 
the next step was to send your stormtroopers, your missionaries, into Africa and the Caribbean to finish off the job, as it were. You know, these are heathens who have to be brought into, into the fold of Christianity. That notion of giving civilized values and modes of behavior to other peoples, that's the ideology that underpinned the empire. In the empire that the missionaries and abolitionists set out to create, indigenous peoples would see their cultures destroyed and their religions eradicated. And yet all this seems almost benign when compared with the grim reality of what imperialism became. Because during the 19th century, their dream was gradually overwhelmed by another vision. One that claimed that the dark races could not be civilized and should instead be exterminated. The event that began the slow collapse of the missionary's vision took place in a then little known outpost of Britain's vast and expanding empire. This is Tasman Arthur. Now, the governor of Tasmania is an evangelical. He knows Wilberforce and he is aware that his future and his reputation depends on how he deals with this problem above all else. Now, he's already been warned in the late 1820s by the British government that the rapidly declining numbers suggests that these people might be exterminated. And were this to happen, it would be an indelible stain on the reputation of the British Empire, but by implication, it would be disastrous for his career. Governor Arthur set out to save the Aboriginals from the violence of the settlers, and to convince them of his good intentions, he produced a poster that was attached to trees in their homelands. It showed a fantasy of interracial unity. The poster spoke of British justice, promising equality before the law. The white killer of an Aboriginal would be hanged. If an Aboriginal killed a settler, he would be hanged. The poster also propagated the lie that the British wanted to integrate with the Aboriginals. It was both a fiction and a complete failure, because out in the bush, the killings on both sides continued. And in 1830, Governor Arthur embarked upon a new policy. He ordered the army to sweep across the area of European settlement in an attempt between Aboriginal people and whites. Of course, it's very hard to document a lot of the settler violence because they know that it is against the law to kill Aboriginal people. They are being told that Aboriginal people are British subjects. But they certainly reveal in their diaries and journals the desire to kill Aboriginal people. What became known as the Black War was a hidden conflict. The landscape itself was the only witness. The British settlers killed any Aboriginals they encountered. Whole groups were massacred. Kidnapping and rape became commonplace. The Aboriginals regularly attacked the settlers as they fought desperately to defend their land. And as the death toll rose, fear fused with hatred. In such circumstances, it was very easy, um, on both sides no doubt, to regard the other side as being totally subhuman. I've got no doubt that the Aborigines thought the Europeans were people totally without morality uh, or without any restraint. Equally, the, the Europeans uh, slipped very quickly into a view that these people were animals and savages. So that conflict in such a racially divided society so easily tips over into an extreme feeling of hatred. The death toll of the Black War had terrifying implications for the Tasmanian Aboriginals. The British, who arrived in ever-increasing numbers, could replace their dead. But the Aboriginals, only 5,000 strong before the war, could not. And by the end of the 1820s... ...is an evangelical. He knows Wilberforce. And he is aware that his future and his reputation depends on how he deals with this problem above all else. Now, he's already been warned in the late 1820s by the British government that the rapidly declining numbers suggests that these people might be exterminated. And were this to happen, it would be an indelible stain on the reputation of the British Empire, but by implication, it would be disastrous for his career. Governor Arthur set out to save the Aboriginals from the violence of the settlers, and to convince them of his good intentions, he produced a poster that was attached to trees in their homelands. It showed a fantasy of interracial unity. The poster spoke of British justice, promising equality before the law. 
The white killer of an Aboriginal would be hanged. If an Aboriginal killed a settler, he would be hanged. The poster also propagated the lie that the British wanted to integrate with the Aboriginals. It was both a fiction and a complete failure, because out in the bush, the killings on both sides continued. And in 1830, Governor Arthur embarked upon a new policy. He ordered the army to sweep across the area of European settlement in an attempt to capture the remaining Aboriginals. He offered... What made the famines especially deadly was that the British had dismantled ancient systems that had for centuries prevented food shortages from turning into famines. If you'd had a poor monsoon and there was a food shortage, many people still had enough. They may have had less, but they would have had enough because they grew their own food, or they would have had access to it from, from other groups in the community who would share it with them during a time of crisis. All this had been wiped away when the British forced the poorest peasants to grow cash crops like wheat and rice for export, thereby ushering them into a global market. And in the 1870s, that market condemned them to death. By 1877, Millions in southern and central India were starving. In desperation, parents sold their children for scraps of food. Many thousands committed suicide. And in some places, the people were forced into cannibalism. And all the while, the food that could have saved them was piled up on the docks of Madras, ready to be shipped to Britain and America. But to Lord Lytton, it was no more than an unfortunate byproduct of the iron laws of social Darwinism. If you read the letters of Lord Lytton, what is so striking about them is not simply their fanatical devotion to, uh, to the market and, the, and, and market forces. It's not simply their you know, parsimony and desire to spend as little as possible, but the enormous calm with which they accept the fact that millions of Indians... ...thousand Aboriginals had learned to hide themselves in the bush. Determined to save them and determined to take their land for white settlement, Governor Arthur changed tactics he now turned away from the army and looked instead to a missionary, George Augustus Robinson. He was the leader of a band of Aboriginal converts and was now hired to go into the bush and bring in the remaining Aboriginals. Robinson took a message that the government wanted to come to some sort of an agreement, a negotiation, a peace treaty. And that is, I believe, undoubtedly the way the Aborigines saw it. They too saw this as a way to end a conflict which they had realised they could never win. They could never get rid of the Europeans. If they stayed and fought, they would be wiped out. And Robinson and his intermediaries convinced them that they should temporarily go to an island where they will be looked after and fed, and that they will ultimately come back to their homelands. The island was called Flinders Island, and 300 Tasmanian Aboriginals who had been collected by Robinson were transported here. Robinson came with them in the official role of chief... Very prominent, and become more prominent through the degenerations. Eugen Fischer came to Namibia to prove one basic point, and that was that racial mixing was always bad, and that the African gene is dominant over the white gene. Fischer's work in Rehoboth sealed his reputation as one of Germany's leading racial scientists. It also brought him recognition from a nation that was then experiencing the greatest influx of immigration the world had ever seen. In the first years of the 20th century, the ethnic makeup of America was being transformed as millions of immigrants poured into her great cities. Many of those who feared that mass immigration would lead to widespread racial mixing looked to the ideas of eugenics, an increasingly powerful science. Eugenics flourished, mutated, and went out of control when it got to the United States. And the irony is that the eugenics movement in the United States, which, which uh, certainly descended directly from Galton, um, had the great advantage of having a lot of money, a huge amount of money. Some of that money was used to establish the Eugenics Records Office, ran by the infamous Charles Davenport. In order to defend the health and purity of the white race, Davenport and his followers sought to identify those classes and those races in America whom they considered genetically unfit. 
identified and monitored the site about the way the Tasmanians lived. To the Europeans, it appeared that the Tasmanians were without culture, they were without religion, they were godless. So they looked upon the Tasmanians as people who'd been left behind uh, by history. And they also related to a very popular idea of the late 18th century, that is the great chain of being, that the various races of humankind were arranged in hierarchical order, and that the Tasmanians were uniquely savage and primitive, and therefore can be treated almost as animals. The British set about building a new capital and settling the surrounding countryside, land that for millennia had been the prime hunting ground of the Aboriginals. Out in these fields and pastures, far from the control of the authorities, the settlers were free to displace and abuse the Aboriginals. From the 1820s, a huge amount of Aboriginal land has been taken up. And there is this enormous struggle between Aboriginal people and whites. Of course, it's very hard to document a lot of the settler violence because they know that it is against the law to kill Aboriginal people. They are being told that Aboriginal people are British subjects. But they certainly reveal in their diaries and journals the desire to kill Aboriginal people. What became known as the Black War was a hidden conflict. The landscape itself was the only witness. The, the battle against slavery had been led from the pulpit by an alliance of Christian abolitionists and missionaries. They had fought the campaign from their churches and meeting halls. In the 1830s, it was their views that dominated the national debate on race. When slavery was finally abolished, there would have been an enormous sense of elation and achievement on the part of the abolitionists. Don't forget, this was a 50-year campaign from 1787 onwards, involving hundreds of thousands of ordinary British people, petitions, etc. So that when slavery was abolished, the abolitionists had won a sense of triumph. I think they also felt that that question, am I not a man and a brother, was answered. The abolitionist response to that great question was that although men and brothers, black people were lesser men and lesser brothers. I think in that moment, the dominant perspective is of a hierarchical racial order, but one in which it's a question of culture and civilization. They certainly do not think that black people are equal to them at this time. They think maybe at some time in the future, they will be equal. The mission to raise up the black and brown peoples of the world to the supposedly superior level of white Englishmen was not to be confined to the former slaves. This was to be the great task that would justify the expansion of the British Empire. Of specialists. And you find that throughout the plant and the animal world. There are bugs on top of bugs on top of bugs, each one surviving at another's expense, each one filling a niche that another can't occupy. People, Darwin said, are the same way. They are expansive organisms. In other words, Englishmen are just like other organisms. They are successful because they are good at expanding. Those who understood colonialism and human competition in terms of Darwin's theories became known as the social Darwinists. Men like the radical biologist Thomas Henry Huxley and the famous economist Herbert Spencer. And social Darwinism foresaw very different fates for the various races of mankind. Evolution was in operation. It was advancing the most recently evolved, the most successfully evolved, that is the Northern Europeans and the British. But evolution also suggested that there had to be losers in this great cosmic process. And the losers were those peoples who could not compete. And once put into competition with superior races, were doomed to disappear. And this was likely to happen to all the native peoples in North America, in the Pacific, and in Africa. Across the world, the question of treating other people with some degree of justice and rule of law finally went out of the window and was demolished in, uh, in the 1860s over Morelbe. You know, from then on we knew that the empire was about ruling people with a maximum degree of coercion. <laughs> The 
some of the new ideas about race in the High Victorian age drew their evidence from the world of the dead. Based on the study of corpses and skeletons, the burgeoning science of anatomy laid the foundations for a new scientific racism. In Britain, the most important race scientist was a now forgotten Edinburgh surgeon. Ruined by a body snatching scandal in the 1820s, he had fled Britain in disgrace. But in the 1840s, Dr. Robert Knox resurfaced with the publication of a new book. Race is everything. Literature, science, art, in a word, civilization depends on it. For Robert Knox in that book, race is everything. It determined your character, it determined your position in civilization, it determined your destiny. Can the black races become civilized? I should say not. He saw racial conflict and extermination happening all around the world. It was natural for him to believe that racial types were bound to struggle and that the can be treated almost as animals. The British set about building a new capital and settling the surrounding countryside, land that for millennia had been the prime hunting grounds of the Aboriginals. Out in these fields and pastures, far from the control of the authorities, the settlers were free to displace and abuse the Aboriginals. From the 1820s, a huge amount of Aboriginal land has been taken up. And there is this enormous struggle between Aboriginal people and whites. Of course, it's very hard to document a lot of the settler violence because they know that it is against the law to kill Aboriginal people. They are being told that Aboriginal people are British subjects. But they certainly reveal in their diaries and journals the desire to kill Aboriginal people. What became known as the Black War was a hidden conflict. The landscape itself was the only witness. The British settlers killed any Aboriginals they encountered. Whole groups were massacred. Kidnapping and rape became commonplace. The Aboriginals regularly attacked the settlers as they fought desperately to defend their land. And as the death toll rose, fear fused with hatred. In such circumstances, it was very easy, um, on both sides no doubt, to regard the other side as being totally subhuman. I've got no doubt that the Aborigines thought the Europeans were people totally without morality. A thousand people were exterminated with a speed and efficiency that was to become the hallmark of 20th century slaughter. The genocides which took place in Namibia in 1904 to 1909, they are the precursor to what happens in the Nazi period. They are the precursor. They have the same symptoms in the sense that you can see the bureaucratization of mass killing. And this, for me, is the central thing. It's not just killing for killing, no. It's a combination between killing and bureaucracy. Today, Shark Island is a campsite for tourists. The Africans who were frozen and starved to death here have been almost erased from memory. But a century after the Namibian genocide, the true horror of what happened on Shark Island is beginning to re-emerge. In a recently discovered mass grave, just a few kilometers from the site of Shark Island, lie some of the victims of the 20th century's first genocide. Other victims were denied even the meager dignity of a mass grave. They became the raw material of racial science, the development of German eugenics. This was the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology and Human Heredity. In the 1930s, the men and women who worked here received grants from the American Rockefeller Foundation. And the leading scientist here was the man who made his name in Namibia, Eugen Fischer. Under the Nazis, Fischer was empowered to sterilize the racially mixed people of Germany's Rhineland, 400 of them, all children. The majority of those sterilized by the Nazis before 1939, however, were the mentally ill. But when the Nazis began their war, they abandoned sterilization in favor of adult euthanasia, the Nazi euphemism for murder. The victims of this program were amongst the first people gassed by the Nazis, but the program was restricted to the mentally ill. 
when um, they have killed the target figure of mental patients they want to kill, which is roughly 70,000 people, they slightly exceeded it. So the first thing they do then is to contact the SS, who have large numbers of what they deem to be sick um, concentration camp prisoners, in other words, people who might have got wear glasses or you know, be myopic or have a wooden leg or something, so they want them out of the way, so these people oblige and they take 15 or 20,000 people from the concentration camps and kill them on behalf of the SS. It's a bit like sort of contract work. And then when the um, uh, SS and other people have decided they're going to go for the big project, which is to kill the Jewish population of Europe, and in particular that of Poland, which is the... Aboriginals from the violence of the settlers. And to convince them of his good intentions, he produced a poster that was attached to trees in their homelands. It showed a fantasy of interracial unity. The poster spoke of British justice, promising equality before the law. The white killer of an Aboriginal would be hanged. If an Aboriginal killed a settler, he would be hanged. The poster also propagated the lie that the British wanted to integrate with the Aboriginals. It was both a fiction and a complete failure, because out in the bush, the killings on both sides continued. And in 1830, Governor Arthur embarked upon a new policy. He ordered the army to sweep across the area of European settlement in an attempt to capture the remaining Aboriginals. He offered a bounty for every Aboriginal taken alive, but the operation was a complete failure. Only two were captured, an old man and a young boy. After years of guerrilla warfare, the last few hundred of the original 5,000 Aboriginals had learnt to hide themselves in the bush. Determined to save them, and determined to take their land for white settlement, Governor Arthur changed tactics. He now turned away from the army and looked instead to a missionary, George Augustus Robinson. He was the leader of a band of Aboriginal Arthur embarked upon a new policy. He ordered the army to sweep across the area of European settlement in an attempt to capture the remaining Aboriginals. He offered a bounty for every Aboriginal taken alive, but the operation was a complete failure. Only two were captured, an old man and a young boy. After years of guerrilla warfare, the last few hundred of the original 5,000 Aboriginals had learnt to hide themselves in the bush. Determined to save them, and determined to take their land for white settlement, Governor Arthur changed tactics. He now turned away from the army and looked instead to a missionary, George Augustus Robinson. He was the leader of a band of Aboriginal converts and was now hired to go into the bush and bring in the remaining Aboriginals. Robinson took a message that the government wanted to come to some sort of an agreement, a negotiation, a peace treaty. And that is, I believe, undoubtedly the way the Aborigines saw it. They too saw this as a way to end a conflict which they had realised they could never win. They could never get rid of the Europeans. If they stayed and fought, they would be wiped out. And Robinson and his intermediaries convinced them that they should temporarily go 